NTV Television Network presents The Other Day, Current Era, 1967. Translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening. Welcome to episode 7 of The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, Current Era. Events, people and occurrences which define the lifestyle. Today we're covering 1967. Color television and drop off running the KGB, the Six Day War, Vysotsky starring in Vertical, 50 years since the October Revolution, a five day work week, the Greek military junta, Krimplin, Carmen Sweet by Bizet and Shedrin, two years of service in the army, three in the navy. Commenting, we have screenwriter and actress Renata Litvinova, economic expert Yegor Gaidar, political expert Sergei Karaganov. From a generic factory newsletter issued three times a week, the literary newspaper turns into a thick weekly publication and a staple among intellectuals. Starting in January 1967, the literary newspaper comes out on Wednesdays, with the first seven out of 16 pages dedicated to literature, the addition of a second color to its design scheme and Pushkin's profile in the printing stereotype. Page 8 was all about art. Page 9 spoke of international policy, followed by everyday social issues by Anatoly Rubinov and courtroom articles by Olga Tchaikovska and Arkady Vaksberg. Page 16 was called 12 Stools Club and contained satirical stories, as well as a newsletter called Horns and Hooves, caricatures titled Oddballs, images by Evgeny Sazanov, the author of a novel called Stormy Stream. At the time, all of this was considered the pinnacle of humor. Many subscribers would immediately open the latest issue to page 16. The literary newspaper received two major awards, while editor-in-chief Alexander Tchaikovsky was granted a Hero of Socialist Labor medal. All because the literary newspaper was needed for people to let off some steam, as suggested by the most perceptive individuals. On May 8, 1967, while opening a new memorial site, Leonid Brezhnev lights the eternal fire on the tomb of the unknown soldier next to the Kremlin wall. The flame itself was delivered from Leningrad, from the tomb of the Revolutionary War soldier at the Field of Mars. In Moscow, Brezhnev received the torch from Alexei Maresyev. During the winter of the preceding year, while celebrating 25 years since defeating the Nazis near Moscow, a decision was made to bury the remains of an unknown soldier in the center of our capital city, like they did in Paris. For the purpose, they opened up a mass grave located near Kriukovom, which was at the forefront of Moscow's line of defense. Those remains were relocated to the Alexander Garden, with full military honors. On the alley leading to the tomb, you had soil from hero towns, the tombstone was made from the same type of rock as Lenin's mausoleum. The memorial was meant to be part of the path towards the country's main shrine. A young artist from Leningrad's Bolshoi Drama Theater named Sergei Yurski comes to Moscow on his first production tour, which turned out to be a fantastic success. Comparing Yurski to Yakontov, who dominated the genre, people would notice a more modern, nuanced take. He was quick to become disingenuous, hope for something, be jealous, dissuade or convince, appear somber, languish, be proud or submissive, attentive or indifferent. Yurski delivered his lines effortlessly. He was on par with Pushkin or Gribayedev in that regard. Yurski would play Chatsky at the Tavstanagov Theater, though a certain critic sarcastically labeled him as a very bum-like Chatsky. The weak but educated half in both of our capital cities was enamored with Yurski. In the Tchaikovsky concert hall, there were no binoculars to spare. People would love watching and listening to Yurski read. Her father was a lovely fellow. Behind the times, though, he had fallen. With books he never had an issue, although he never read them really, considering them to be hollow. Whatever novel might be hidden secretly under her pillow by his daughter was a matter by which father couldn't in the least be bothered. And on the subject of his wife, Richardson was the love of her life. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov.
A large-scale conflict around a cotter issue was what it took to establish Leonid Brezhnev as a formidable player in the state apparatus. The so-called Komsomol Guard was forced to resign. Three top-ranking officials, Politburo member and Central Committee Secretary Alexander Shalepin, KGB Chairman Vladimir Simichasny, First Secretary of the Komsomol Central Committee Sergei Pavlov. It appeared as if their goal was a neo-Stalinist change of direction. With Brezhnev being a sort of intermediate figure, evidently they were preparing for Shalepin to assume General Secretary status. The three would keep replacing each other on two posts. Politburo member and Central Committee Secretary Alexander Shalepin, or Iron Shurik, formerly chairman of the KGB and first secretary of the Komsomol Central Committee, KGB chairman Vladimir Semichasny, former first secretary of the Komsomol Central Committee, first secretary of the Komsomol Central Committee Sergei Pavlov, the rosy Komsomol chieftain according to Yevtushenko. Shalepin was demoted to VTSSPS chairman, Simichasny to third deputy prime minister of Ukraine, Pavlov to chairman of the state's sports committee. Yuri Andropov becomes the new chairman of the committee for state security, a man who used to be central committee secretary of communication with foreign communist parties. Formerly a second-tier executive in Karelium, Andropov first drew attention to himself in 1956, when, acting as Soviet ambassador in Hungary, he coordinated the suppression of an uprising in Budapest. Rumors about Andropov and his doings as chairman of the KGB brought about him a conflicting reputation. Of a high-ranking official who had the most insight into what was really going on in the country, wine and modern art connoisseur, and ruthless oppressor of all dissidents, dissidence of various measure was becoming a popular trade in cities. Under Andropov, the amount of refuseniks who were denied emigration to Israel grew rapidly. Meanwhile, patriots would say that Andropov's wife was Jewish, and that he himself bore too much semblance to a Jew. Foreign Sovietologists called Andropov a gendarme in a tuxedo. The entire world was now aware of the term KGB. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, the word committee now implied solely Andropov's committee, which was a deep drilling bureau. They've removed the commemorative plaque from the main headquarters at the Lubanka Square, which said Andropov used to work here. That said, Andropov's activity became a turning point in the history of Russian special service agencies. He restored their all-seeing eye status that they'd nearly lost. Soon after being appointed, Andropov first became a candidate and then a full-fledged member of the Central Committee Politburo. For the first time since Beria, the chief of the secret police became part of the country's highest-ranking administration. Under Andropov, the abbreviation KGB eclipsed the preceding MGB, OGPU, GPU, and in terms of notoriety became a match for the NKVD and Cheka. The movie Kidnapping Caucasian Style by director Leonid Gaidai shatters box office records set by his previous comedy film Operation Y. In Kidnapping, Shurik in his glasses is up against not just the three crooks Vitsin, Nikulin and Margonov, but also a Caucasian head of district, all while defending the honor of a college student, Komsomol member, athlete and all-around pretty lady. In no uncertain terms, the movie pointed out that not all was well in the Caucasus. A white tunic coat gives you quite a lot to think about. That sounds like some politically indifferent reasoning. The film showcases a few blatant remnants of the past. Who's the groom? Around here that's often unknown until it's time for the wedding. A few indecent habits. Though Gaidai's signature eccentricity was what really mattered. Not to mention his hilarious gags. I feel sorry for that bird. This was their last performance together, but what a performance by Vitsin, Nikulin and Margunov. 
If I'd have been a sultan, I'd have had three wives. And I would have been surrounded by three times the beauty. Kidnapping redeemed the twist, the dance of the decade. First it would be uncharacteristically performed by the scum, but then twist would be cleaned from all the filth by decent members of our younger generation. In my opinion, Natalia Varley's best role was when she played Panichka in the film V. Her first appearance in this movie was completely out of nowhere. She was literally walking in the middle of a highway. She wasn't even carrying a purse. She didn't have any sort of belongings with her. Meanwhile, she slept in the trendiest bed of the time, which would be a sleeping bag under the open sky. She also danced, sang, wore skin-tight clothes. She was the literal embodiment of the true ideals of women of that era. She was always on the move, appearing out of nowhere and disappearing into thin air. At the end of the movie, she boarded a bus, with it remaining uncertain as to what happened to her later in the film. The first ever spaceflight casualty. Vladimir Komarov, who flew aboard the Voskhod in 1964, who was also the first man in history to fly to space twice, he died right before they were able to finish a test flight program for the new Soyuz 1 spacecraft. The plan was for Soyuz 1, which Komarov was flying aboard, to dock in space with Soyuz 2, which would be launched the very next day and have three cosmonauts on board. However, Komarov's vessel began malfunctioning as soon as it made it into orbit. The Soyuz 2 launch had to be cancelled. Upon re-entry, Vladimir Komarov masterfully descended manually, but the straps on his parachute got tangled, which prevented the chute from fully opening up. The Soyuz 1, while traveling at 140 km an hour, hit the ground and exploded. The memorial note didn't disclose any details. After a series of successful flights by Vostoks and Voshods, Komarov's death was nearly shocking. In 1967, the USSR State Prize was awarded to Irakli Andronikov for his book Lermontov Research and Findings. This was a rare instance when a literary study work essentially became known to the entire country. Andronikov was the main speaking head, so to speak, on television at that time hosting the process of culturing. The first time Andronikov was invited to be a TV show guest was in 1954. They wanted him to speak for no longer than 15 minutes, but Andronikov went on to talk for an hour and 10 minutes, and quite eloquently and articulately at that, he presented his famous NFI mystery. He was a doctor of philology and an honored man of culture in Russia and Georgia. By the end of the 60s, Andronikov had turned the stagnant fable into a history of literature, historical and literary compositions into a stage performance, stage performance into a parody of himself, Irakli Andronikov's signature bit called First Time on Stage. When the inspector brought you to the orchestra, you suddenly kicked him and did this move with your foot. Then you came up to the contrabass player to pat him on the head, as if saying, don't worry, we're on the same team. Then you elbowed the cello player in the face. Then, as if to show off your good manners, you turned, caught a fiddlestick, brushed the notes from off the music stand. Then you waltzed down that narrow path between the violins and the cello, looking all repulsive and disgusting. Then, upon making it to the conductor's stand, you proceeded to roll up your pants as if you stepped into some cold water. 62 countries take part in the largest international exhibition in history, the Expo 67 in Montreal. The fair kicked off with some cannon fire. The Soviet Union's pavilion at Expo 67 was made from glass, steel and aluminum. The Expo's official motto was man and his world. The Soviet hall would later be dismantled and shipped back home to the VDNK. They'd officially name it Moscow, but continue to call it the Montreal Pavilion. Most visitors share a common opinion that the Soviet hall is the best one at Expo 67. In 1967, Mikhail Bulgakov's famous words, 
that manuscripts don't burn proved to be true. In the first issue of Moscow magazine for 1967, almost 30 years after it was written, Bulgakov's novel The Master and Margarita was finally fully published. In the country which read the most, this was the most iconic book. The novel was published thanks to Konstantin Simonov, who wrote the foreword. Bulgakov's work struck a chord with everybody in different ways. With 140,000 copies printed, supply was way behind demand. The coveted magazine issues were stolen from libraries, though in some rare cases they were timely transferred to private funds. Bulgakov's text would be ripped out and bound back together. The most educated folks would add back to the text whatever the censors deleted. Then there was the obvious reprinting using a typewriter or a rotor print press. The Master and Margarita went from official Soviet to self-published printed material. The Patriarch Pons district would be canonized, with aficionados giving newbies tours around the places described in Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita. The sixth entrance at Bolshaya Sadovaya 10, where Bulgakov used to live, became the center of attraction. The following phrases were borrowed by the reading public from Bulgakov's novel. Just fixing my stove, minding my business, no ID, no person. Semi-fresh sturgeon. The saying there a bit spoiled by housing issues is contained within a scene omitted by Soviet censorship. They wouldn't publish that part in the USSR until 1973. On June 5th, war broke out in the Middle East. It ended on the 10th of June, which earned it its six-day moniker. During that time, Israel, while waging battle with Syria, Egypt and Jordan, having one-fifteenth of the population and being short on territory by 60 times, was able to occupy an area four times the size of its own territory. Allegations of Israeli aggression begin to sound even harsher than the phrase American aggressors. Knowing full well about the military preparations being made by their Arab adversaries, Israel carries out a ruthless preemptive attack on 25 Egyptian airfields. 375 brand new MiG-21s were destroyed before they could even take off. Israeli tanks headed towards the heart of the Sinai Peninsula, while paratroopers took the center of Jerusalem by storm. On day two, war on Israel was declared by Iraq, Sudan, Algeria, Yemen and Kuwait. The East Mediterranean saw a clash between the US and Soviet Navy. The USSR demands that the US pressure its ally, while threatening to launch nuclear missiles. During a conference between the region's oil producers, it was decided to halt oil supply to countries supporting Israel. Israel's assault was thwarted a mere 40 kilometers away from Damascus. Bullet holes and shrapnel damage on the Zion Gate in the old city of Jerusalem. The new territory acquired by Israel during that six-day war has been common knowledge around the world since then. Egypt lost the Sinai Peninsula and Gaza, Syria surrendered the Golan Heights, Jordan, the west bank of the Jordan River and East Jerusalem with its sacred relics. The spoils were just as impressive. The Six-Day War declassified the latest Soviet weaponry. The Egyptians abandoned some anti-aircraft missile systems near the Suez Canal. Israel also seized about 300 fully operational T-54 tanks. On the last day of the war, the Soviet Union announces the severing of diplomatic relations with Israel. In a rare turn of events, a special Central Committee plenary meeting was held to discuss the situation in the Middle East. The Soviet Union called for an emergency session at the United Nations Organization. Here's a fragment of Chairman of the Council of Ministers Kasigin's speech at the UN. Our main objective is to drive the invaders out from the territory of those Arab countries temporarily occupied by Israeli troops. That crisis in the Middle East was a peculiar episode in the history of the Cold War. It began developing as a result of Arab and Israeli nationalism. Only later did the United States and the Soviet Union become major players in that conflict. By 1967, the United States had transferred a whopping $1.5 billion to Israel in military aid. Meanwhile, we were arming the Arabs. However, we weren't prepared for Egypt's rapid defeat in that six-day war. 
This was followed by an emotional response. On one hand, this emotional response prevented Israeli troops from progressing further into Sinai. But on the other, it led to disrupting our diplomatic relations. We failed to be flexible. Meanwhile, the United States retained their flexibility. They were able to work with and gamble on the controversy between Israel and the Arab nations. Currently, we're having a rough time restoring that flexibility, after losing quite a lot in the Arab world. The younger generation knew well about children taking part in the patriotic war. Among them were gold star medalists and bearers of other superior honors. But in 1967 a fresh motif emerged in heroic patriotic education, in the form of children taking part in the civil war. Based on a book by Pavel Blyachin called Red Devils, which was all but forgotten, director Edmund K. Asayan shot an action film called The Elusive Avengers. Quality is always appreciated. Millions of young lads swarmed to theaters, and they couldn't help but notice that this was one very well-executed movie. The young main characters were brilliantly written, in a time when we were still 25 years away from political correctness in theory and in practice. Tanka represented the indigenous people, Yashka the gypsy, or Russian of color, Ksanka represented the female side, Valerka the intelligentsia. The adult supporting characters were also well written. Savely Kramarov, with his legendary catchphrase, dead men with scythes were standing alongside the road. And there was silence. That's hogwash. Yefim Kopelian, who played Adam on Bornash, in helpless anger. The Red Commissioners sent in their henchmen to confuse the people. Boris Sitchkin as Baba Kastorsky. I am Boba Kastorsky, an authentic coupletist. I like to sing my verses, and I seem to do a pretty good job. I sing to the left, then I sing to the right. Then there were the unparalleled cavalry stunts accompanied by Boris Makrausov's music. Whilst mixing men and horses together, Mosfilm Studio was forging a new benchmark. The bridge is on fire! USSR Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev meets with President Gamal Abdel Nasser. In 1967, to honor the anniversary of the Great October Revolution, construction began of the Astankana TV Tower, the tallest in the world if you factor in the flagpole, at 1,749 feet. And right across the street a technical center was being built, which would become the largest building in Europe. It would officially be named the October 50th Anniversary Technical Center. The Astankana Tower was a magnificent thing. Located 1,105 feet above the ground was a restaurant called Seventh Heaven, which revolved, allowing you to have your lunch and observe a full panorama of Moscow. Three days after the tower was put into service, the first ever color program was aired from the Red Square. Just as Vladimir the Great was choosing a religion and finally ruled in favor of Byzantine orthodoxy, his distant descendants out of all of the available color transmission systems preferred the French CCAM. Our relationship with France was more favorable than with other Western European countries that used PAL, or with America and its NTSC. Should TV be black and white or color? People would argue on the matter more often than about color and sound in cinema. The official recommendation was to keep information and political commentary in black and white, so that the color wouldn't distract one from the subject matter. In 1967, a memorial complex was opened at the Mamayev Korgan in Volgograd, conceived by Yevgeny Vucetic. This was the largest sculpture in the world, 2.5 times taller than the Statue of Liberty in New York. The motherland calls and her sword, imagery that was easily grasped by the general public. Here we have the Hall of Glory, a man with a machine gun and a grenade, this impressive monument was regarded by millions of contemporaries as the embodiment of modern sculpting. 
1967, one of the Soviet Union's most iconic figures was finally legitimized. In Stanislav Gavarukhin's film debut, Vertical, the role of bearded radio operator Valodya, who was also a mountaineer and a guitarist, was played by Taganka drama and comedy theater actor Vladimir Vysotsky. For the first time ever, instead of thousands of Yauza tape players, thousands of movie screens depicted a man with a raspy voice singing, if all of a sudden your bro proved to be neither friend nor foe, if whether worthy he be or not, you can't tell on the spot. This was a Vysotsky without a hint of dissidence. No insolence, no strain in his voice. Songs about pretty much everything, as a means of taking in reality. An encyclopedia of Soviet life in the 60s, and then the 70s, when it came to songs about sports, back then Vysotsky said that he'd like to bring the total amount up to 49, by the number of sporting disciplines, vibrant language combined with a broad scope, not to mention that Vysotsky's songs enriched the common language with phrases such as scary to the point of terror, a pity, a shame, but oh well, and I remember everything, I was completely sober. Ты его не брони, гони, Вверх таких не беру, иду, Про таких не пою. By 1967, Vysotsky had already written a full mountaineering cycle, he'd partially completed a military series, penal battalions on the communal graves, save our souls, a sports album on professional skating and boxing, there was also a song about yoga, and one called The Flowers on the Neutral Zone are extraordinarily beautiful. While the hunters were loading their rifles, In 1967, the country was celebrating 50 years since the October Revolution. Given a lack of personalities, a cult of anniversaries blossomed. The scale of competition when it came to properly celebrating this national holiday was off the charts. First, the Central Committee passed an order on preparation for celebrations, and then theses in honor of the 50th anniversary. Plus, they established an order of the October Revolution. Throughout the entire year, other events that occurred during that revolution were also celebrated. 50 years since Lenin returned to Petrograd, 50 years since the departure to Razlev, 50 years since the phrase there's a certain party was uttered, a Lenin monument was set up in the Kremlin, an obelisk was installed in the Manej Square, which said in this place a monument will be erected to honor 50 years of Soviet government. Meanwhile, the order of the October Revolution became second only to the order of Lenin. The flag of socialism, raised by the October Revolution, hovers above the world as a symbol of humankind's future. That ceremonial meeting at the Palace of Congresses is where the mutation began of the Communist Party's fundamental idea. The anniversary report mentioned developed socialism for the first time ever. This was the new administration's key theoretical discovery. Developed socialism was a sort of compromise between the party's agenda and the actual situation. Talks about building everlasting socialism could be heard since the late 30s. Communism, which they decided to pursue just six years prior, wasn't promised in the long run. Developed socialism was a sort of intermediate stage before establishing true communism. However, ideologists did warn that it would be around for quite a while. In Leningrad, the cradle of the Russian Revolution, they had a new October Hall ready for the ceremonial meeting. And for the first time in years, they added a costume show element to the parade on the Red Square. Armed proletarian Red Army soldiers, a marching revolutionary sailor squad, 
And here we have the legendary Tachankas used by the cavalry. An armored car squadron. This is what the army of workers and peasants used to look like at the dawn of the Soviet regime. Theaters had to celebrate the 50th anniversary of October by putting on plays and Danish performances. Oleg Yefremov, who ran the Sovermenik Theater in Moscow, set up three stage acts in sequence. First, the Decemberists came out onto the stage, then Narodnaya Volya, followed by the Bolsheviks. Sovermenik was established in 1956. This was the first theater that sprouted from the masses after the war. Their signature style? Socialist neorealism. Their breed of actor defined the decade. Back then, trilogies were a popular docudrama genre. The trilogy Zorina Swabodina Shatrova was about goals and means of achieving them. The Decemberists, formerly heroes made out of pure steel as described by Herzen, appeared in the form of living people. The choice was between apolitical ethics or unethical politics. Narodnaya Volya. When preparing for each assassination attempt, Perovskaya would promise herself that this would be the last time. Hunting down the Tsar, the Bolsheviks, Kaplan wounded Lenin, the Council of People's Commissars, after a bit of thought, rules in favor of Red Terror, singing the Internationale right after the vote. The audience follows suit. The play Bolsheviks was shut down by censors. And that's when the Minister of Culture intervened. Ortseva held Yefremov in high regard. The last three of our plays were dedicated to the anniversary. In my opinion, that's our main achievement for this anniversary year. While describing socialism's achievements over the span of 50 years, Soviet propaganda started using a new trick, comparing the current situation to 1913. This is what the statistical data would look like. Heavy industry output in the USSR is currently 63 times that of the year 1913. On average, real income had increased by 6.5 times for laborers and 8.5 times for farmers. The increase in energy, automobile and mineral fertilizer production looked especially dramatic, amounting to hundreds and even thousands of times. Meanwhile, there were no tractors and harvesters period back in 1913. Back in 1913, in terms of its economic development, Russia was on the same level as some of the poorer European countries, such as Portugal and Greece. Now, after about five decades went by, the correlation remained the same, despite our different paths. In 1967, we were yet again pretty much on par with Portugal and Greece in terms of income per capita. It's worth noting that, having been pursuing socialism for a while, that took a serious toll on the Russian economy. It led to a chronic state of crisis in farming, to an irrational resource-consuming economic structure, a small proportion of processed goods being exported, and living standards depending on the export of crude oil. On the night from the 20th to the 21st of April 1967, Stylianus Patakas' tanks enter Athens. The military temporarily rendered ineffective 11 articles of the Greek constitution, which had to do with civil liberties and the ban of execution on political grounds. This was the Greek military coup. Papadopoulos claims that Greece is ill and lying on the operating table. Soon the entire world will realize that the main surgeon of this junta holds in his hand the axe of fascism. Throughout the night, eight and a half thousand left-wing activists were apprehended, as well as members of parliament and trade union officials. Soviet newspapers back then wrote, however, the people of Greece proudly said their ohi, or no. People fled the country en masse with Greek communists immigrating to the USSR for the most part, them being assigned to a small settlement in Uzbekistan. Meanwhile in Greece, military tribunals and island-based concentration camps were unfolding. Political prisoners were being tortured, 
The military junta would stand for another seven years in the birthplace of democracy, with the colonels constantly replacing each other in the top position. During the third session of the USSR Supreme Soviet in its seventh convocation, two crucial decisions were made, the first of which involved establishing a five-day work week. This didn't necessarily mean cutting back on the work week, but now Soviet citizens did have to make one less trip to and from work and take on one less shift. People were granted what they'd call a constant array of free time, as opposed to an extra hour every evening. Weekends now became a thing in the USSR. As for the second decision, this was a decree on how to arrange the enactment of the USSR's law on universal military service. This is the last time First Class Sergeant Vladimir Puchkov is manning his post. Let's give the rookies an opportunity to watch the pros at work. The main focus of the legal act and the corresponding report read by Defense Minister Marshal Grechko was amending the duration of actual military service for soldiers, sailors, sergeants and petty officers. Up until that time, sailors served for four years and soldiers on the ground did three years. But from then on, Navy service was reduced to three years, Army and Air Force to two. Universal military service back then was truly universal. As a result, everybody was affected by these changes. Millions of guys and millions of their girlfriends, millions of those guys and girlfriends' parents. Within the army, two types of soldiers came about. Some of them had already been serving for a year, with two more to go, while others were newcomers who were also looking at two years. This didn't sit well with the last of the three-year soldiers, who decided to take it out on the first two-year draftees. This is considered to be the moment when bullying or didavshina began, when more experienced soldiers would abuse newcomers. It was always normal for new recruits to be mistreated, but now the principal Gramps used to work when he was young and now you go ahead and do his work became systematic. So another reason for why harassment became a thing is supposedly the fact that first they started enlisting guys who had done time in juvie and then recruiting grown men who had done time in an actual prison. First they were allocated to the sort of peripheral construction battalions, but later they'd find their way into primary branches of the armed forces. In 1967, consumers saw a new logo appear on certain goods, a pentagon with some sort of rune inside, and an inscription which said USSR. This was a seal of quality. Only products that passed a state certification test were labeled with the seal. A follow-up test would be conducted in two to three years to confirm that they're still eligible. The first products to receive the label were top-notch refrigerators and television sets, though nobody really doubted their high quality in the first place. It was virtually impossible to find a zeal or a rubin in stock in a store. In time, less stringent certification standards would be applied. But then again, the list of hard-to-attain goods would also be expanded. The coveted Pentagon would no longer matter to consumers, who were prepared to buy any model even without that seal of quality. People would joke about the seal of quality in fact spreading its arms and legs and sighing, as if saying sorry for me being this way. However, the leaders of two superpowers agreed on the need for initiating a dialogue. A new synthetic material called crimpline is invented which didn't crumple. Clothing made from crimpline didn't need ironing. All you had to do was wash it, carefully hang it to dry, and it's ready for use. The one serious drawback being static. Crimpline would often spark, crackle, and stick to your body. To combat static, anti-static liquid compounds were put into production, with some of the nation's most desperate men consuming those anti-static liquids as if they were hard liquor. In time, to complement crimpling with embossed elements, thick wool-like fabrics for making trench coats would be manufactured. In 1967, Carmen tried on a pair of point shoes. The Bolshoi Theater hosted the premiere of a ballet called Carmen Suite, with music from Bizet's opera in the transcription of Rodian Shadrin. Maya Plisetska, who had been doing swan dances for 20 years, finally received a role which fit her own personality. Choreography was done by a Cuban ballet master named Alberto Alonso. Mm 
For the first time, Plisetska abandons her captivating classic moves and provides ballet lovers with something a bit more up-to-date. The first reviews spoke of pornography instead of choreography. The second performance was initially banned, but the ban was lifted because they'd already prepared a banquet at a restaurant. She was ordered to put on a skirt and scrap anything sexual. A performance was scheduled for Expo 67, but it never took place. Eventually people grew accustomed to the ballet. Plisetska was now regarded as a devilish young lady in addition to being the leading ornithologist. The transcript of the opera done by her husband turned the combination Bize Shedrin into a double surname, akin to Saltikov Shedrin. Carmen Suite was a colossal hit, which especially struck a chord with pro athletes, artistic swimmers, gymnasts, and figure skaters. We've just covered the year 1967 in our series The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, current era. Next time we'll be reviewing 1968. Kaliningsky Prospect, jokes about Chapayev, the Moskvich 412, escalation of the Vietnam War, Prague Spring, sending troops to Czechoslovakia, the Hochlama fashion trend, the Komsomol's 50th anniversary, the Vremia newscast. See you for a new episode and a new year. Farewell.